gives me the great pleasure to present to you today Professor Milton Friedman. I want to talk today about the contrast between myths that are widely believed by the public at large and what I regard as a reality which typically contradicts those myths. As you are all aware, there, was been a, there has been a drastic shift in public attitudes and public opinions in the past 50 years or so with respect to the role of the individual on the one hand and the role of government and collective institutions on the other. There has been a shift in the philosophy and attitudes of the public from a belief in individual responsibility, from a belief in a society in which the role of government was as an umpire, to a belief in a society in which the emphasis is on social responsibility and the role of government as big brother and protector of the individual. As always when such shifts arise in public opinion, they are largely produced and reinforced by the development of myths about prior experience. Someone once wrote, and I'm not sure who it was, that a myth is like an air mattress. There's nothing in it, but it's wonderfully comfortable. And deflation causes an uncomfortable jolt. <laughs> well, my purpose today is to give you that jolt. When myths get established and are adopted, they tend to be so strongly held, they tend to become so much a part of you, that when anyone comes along and differs with them and contradicts them, he risks automatically being dismissed as a crackpot. But I shall nonetheless take the risk of being dismissed as a crackpot because it seems to me so urgent that we deflate these myths, recognize what the reality is, in order to be able to provide a basis for a change in our philosophy a, a reversal of the direction of our thought. In my opinion, if we do not do so, if we continue on the road we have been going, if we continue to rely more and more on government and less and less on the individual, we are condemned to a future of tyranny and misery. And therefore, it seems to me essential for the future of this country that we recognize these myths for what they are and adjust our thinking to a correct perception of our present and our past. I'm uh, uh, encouraged in this venture by another quotation, one which comes from a 19th century American humorist by the name of Josh Billings, who wrote, wrote somewhere, it ain't what people know that causes trouble, it's what they know that ain't so. And that's what I'm going to devote this talk to, to trying to tell you about some things you know that ain't so. I am going to try to cover five myths that are part of your thinking. And if they're not part of your thinking, they will tend to become so after you take your first course in American history. The first of those myths is a robber baron myth. The myth that somehow or other in the 19th century, there was an era of uh, rugged, unrestrained individualism in which heartless monopoly capitalists exploited the poor unmercifully and ground them beneath their heels. The second myth I'm going to talk about is a Great Depression myth. The myth that the Great Depression from 1929 until the late 30s was produced by a failure of private enterprise. The third myth I want to talk about is the demand for government service myth. The myth that government has had to step in because of a failure of the private market and a great widespread demand for government services. The fourth myth I'm going to talk about was suggested by Mr. Eccles in his introduction. It's a free lunch myth. 
the myth that there is such a thing as a free lunch. And the final myth I want to talk about is the Robin Hood myth, the myth that somehow or other government operates by taking money from the rich and giving it to the poor. Let me start with the first of those myths, the robber baron myth. The myth that in the 19th century was a period in which the rich became richer and the poor poorer. That it was a century in which you had a conflict between Wall Street and the working man. That it was a period in which particularly the farmers of the Middle West were being ground beneath the rapacious activities of the Wall Street financiers in which there was widespread farm distress and misery. Now this myth had its origins in the 19th century. It produced the widespread greenback movement that you will learn about in your history books. A party uh, which at one time reached significant uh, size. A party devoted to the idea that all of the problems of the time could be solved if only the government would print enough of those nice pieces of paper which are lay a colored green on the back and which are called greenbacks. It was a period that also gave rise to the free silver movement. To Williams Jennings Bryan, the silver-tongued orator from North Platte, if I remember rightly, from these areas, who gave his famous speech uh, on the cross of gold in 1896 in Chicago at the Democratic Convention, in which he asked whether mankind shall be crucified on a cross of gold a speech which got him the presidential nomination of the Democratic Party. And he subsequently was a nominee of the, president, of the Democratic Party for several uh, subsequent elections. Fortunately, never elected. <laughs> that was a myth. What was the reality? The reality is that there is almost no period in human history which saw as rapid and widespread an increase in the well-being of the ordinary man as the 19th century. That was a period when millions of people from all over the world streamed to these shores. They came here with empty hands in the hope and the belief that they could make a better life for themselves and their children, and they succeeded. I suspect that most of the people in this room who are American residents and citizens today are descendants of the people who came to these shores in that period. I know to take the immediate local case, the Eccles family derives from a, 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 Scot, a Scotsman who came to this country in the middle of the 19th century. I, uh, my parents came here in the 1890s from a part of Europe which is today part of the Soviet Union, although at that time it was part of Hungary. And I suspect most of the people in this room have similar backgrounds. Now, do you suppose those people kept coming to these shores in order to be exploited? Do you think they came here to be ground under the heels of rapacious monopoly capitalists? Not a bit of it. A few people might have been led here under misapprehension. You conceivably could have had an initial inflow of people who thought they were going to improve their lot and ended up being worse off. But you would not have had a continuing inflow. They would not have sent back to the old country for their relatives and friends. You would not have had a flow of millions upon millions year after year. And of course they were not exploited. They were not ground under the heel. They got jobs, they spread out west to the middle west, to the far west, to where we are now. And they made of what was a desolate country a, a country that was prosperous and green and productive and improved their own lot. With respect to agriculture in particular, that was a period when the number of farmers increased. It was a period when the price of farmland rose. Now, of course, then as now, every farmer would have liked it better if he had done still better. What happened then, of course, was that the spread of farms, increasing productivity, the development of machinery, the bringing under the plow of productive land led to a great increase in production which led to a decline in the prices of farm products. So it's true, the prices of farm products went down. But that was a sign of success. It was not a sign of failure. And the evidence 
that it was a sign of success was a rise in the price of farmland. After all, if this decline in the price of products had been a sign of failure, if it had been an indication that the farmer was being ground under the heel of Wall Street, why would people have been willing to pay higher and higher prices for the land from which those crops were produced? So the actual story is one of a great growth of productivity in agriculture, a great development of agriculture in this country. If we turn to the, to the charge that that was a period of heartlessness, a period in which the rich were willing to say, let the public be damned, as one man was quoted incorrectly as saying, if we turn to that charge, let me call to your attention that the 19th century, the period when we came the closest we've ever come to pure unrestrained individualism, a period when government spending, the spending of the federal government in Washington amounted to less than 3% of the national income, when essentially you had no restrictions on immigration and few restrictions on economic activity. Let me point out that that was also the period of the greatest flowering of charitable activity in the United States. That was a period when you had the establishment of so many independent private schools and colleges around the country. It was a period when the private non-profit Elemosinary hospitals grew and sprouted in every city in the land. It was a period of the Carnegie Libraries. It was a period of the founding of the Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. You name it, and you will find that the charitable elemosinary activities date back to the period of the 19th century. So the robber baron myth is a myth, one that should be deflated. It gets its appeal from a common fallacy, from the fallacy that one man's gain must be another man's loss. Of course it is true that many men became wealthy during that period. There were robber barons. There always are robber barons. People are people. Some are good, some are bad, some are in between. And of course, some people did try to mistreat other people. That is part of the course of history, unfortunately. But the main part of the story is that the process whereby some people became wealthy was also the process which opened up the country and provided opportunities for millions of other people to have a modest competence to be able to improve their own lot. It was the robber barons who, who were instrumental in building the railroads that joined the country together who were instrumental in developing the industries of this country and in thereby providing the opportunities for the ordinary man to improve his lot on life. Everybody can benefit. You can have some people become wealthy, not at the expense of other people, but by enabling other people to become wealthy. We had robber barons then and we have robber barons today. But there's a big difference between the robber barons then and the robber barons today. The robber barons then primarily could get their money only if people freely gave it to them. They got their money by selling a service, and nobody had to buy it. And if people bought it, it was because it was a better service than it was before. The robber barons today are in large part able to get their money by sending a policeman to take the money out of your pocket. Now that's a figurative expression, not a literal expression, but how do you become wealthy today? by getting government assistance. To mention only one very famous example, by getting government to assign you some TV licenses. <laughs> or by getting any one of a large variety of other, uh, of other sources of government support. If you look at where modern wealth comes from, it almost always comes from political influence which enables you to get benefits at the expense of the public at large. Now that is a zero-sum game. When the money is transferred from some to others through force and coercion in the taxpayer, then it need not be that the one man's benefit is also the other man's benefit. Then it can and often is that both parties uh, 
that, that the party who gains, gains at the expense of the party who pays. So robber barons will always be with us. The crucial question is whether we have a form of economic organization in which one robber baron keeps the other robber baron in check, or whether we have a form of economic and political organization in which one robber baron can help the other robber baron at the expense of the public. I want to turn to the second of these myths, the Great Depression myth. There is hardly any view that is more widespread than the view that somehow or other the Great Depression was produced by a failure of private business. That view is held not only by those who are in favor of greater role of government. It is held by almost everybody. I venture to suggest that if you go to any bankers, the people who are here today at this banking conference, and if you talk to them, I venture to say nine out of ten of them, if, if, if they didn't, hadn't heard what I'm going to say, <laughs> that nine out of ten of them would say, well, of course, the Great Depression was a failure of private business. It was due to an overextension, overspeculation in the 1920s, or it was due to an excessive concentration of wealth in the hands of the wealthy at the expense of the poor in the 1920s, or it was due to speculative investment abroad, or whatnot. But it was a failure of private business, and government had to step in in order to rescue private business from its own failure. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The Great Depression was produced, in my opinion, and I may say this is a, not a random opinion. I will be glad to refer you to a several hundred page book in which it is documented. I won't tell you who the author is. <laughs> Mr. Eccles did that. It was produced, the Great Depression was produced by a failure of government, by a failure of monetary policy. It was produced by a failure of the Federal Reserve System to act in accordance with the intentions of those who established it. It was produced by a failure of the Federal Reserve System despite the presence of knowledge on the part of many of the people in the system about the right course of action. It's interesting to speculate for a moment about why this myth is so widespread. The answer is really very simple in this case. Private enterprise has no press agents. The free market has no press agents. The government has a great many press agents. The Federal Reserve has a great many press agents. And the Federal Reserve, of course, would never admit, never proclaim, that it produced the Great Depression. On the contrary. And again, I don't mean to be criticizing individuals. We're talking about the way institutions operate. You and I are the same as all the rest of us. We're all the same. The hardest thing in the world is for anybody to admit that he made a mistake. If any one of us makes a mistake, we can always find somebody else to blame. And if you read, as I have for my sins had to read, the annual reports of the Federal Reserve System over a 50-year period, there's only one element of humor that lightens that test. And that is, the cyclical fluctuation in the powers of the Federal Reserve. In a good year, when things are good, when the economy is booming, you will read that the Federal Reserve, by its wise policy, by its efficacious management of money, has produced this fine situation. However, let things get bad, and all of a sudden the tone of the annual report is different. Then you discover that despite the best efforts of the Federal Reserve, Outside forces combine to produce difficulties. Even at the depth of the Depression in 1933, when in the spring of that year, the Federal Reserve System, which had been established in order to prevent banking panics and keep banks from closing, when the Federal Reserve System itself closed its doors, and you had a banking holiday for seven days, and when, over the previous three years, a third of the banks of this country closed their doors and went broke because, in my opinion, of the poor policy followed by the Federal Reserve System. Even in 1933, if you read the annual report, 
you will discover how much worse things would have been if the Federal Reserve hadn't behaved so well. <laughs> now, as I say, I don't blame the members of the Federal Reserve for that. Any one of us would do the same thing. We have to find somebody to blame. But as an objective scholar, I can tell you what the facts are. The facts were that from 1929 to 1933, the total quantity of money in the United States, the amount of currency, the amount of bank deposits, what Mr. Eccles referred to as M2, that total amount of money declined by one-third. The total number of banks went down by one-third. And why did the quantity of money decline? It declined because the Federal Reserve System failed to prevent the decline. The Federal Reserve System could have prevented the decline at all times. There never was a moment during that period when the Federal Reserve did not have the power to prevent the decline in the quantity of money. If it had prevented the decline in the quantity of money, you might still have had a recession. But it would have been a garden variety recession. It would have been over in the middle of 1930 or early in 31 at the latest. It would not have been the major catastrophe, not only for this country, but throughout the rest of the world. The, uh, moreover, this is not only hindsight. At all times, the people at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and at a number of other banks were pleading with the Federal Reserve Board in Washington to do the right thing. At all times, there were people in Congress who were arguing that the Federal Reserve System should take a different course. At all times, there were outside commentators. One of the Canadian banks was particularly prescient. But there were other commentators who were pointing out the disastrous effects on the American economy of the restrictive policies that the Federal Reserve System was following and which was causing, was permitting and facilitating a whole series of bank runs. So the Great Depression was not produced by a failure of business. On the contrary, it was produced by a failure of government and a failure of government in an area in which responsibility had been assigned to government since the founding of this country. The Constitution of the United States it gives Congress the power to coin money and set the value thereof. And it was in the management of this fundamental function of government that government failed and produced the Great Depression. We have learned from that failure. The Federal Reserve will not fail in the same way again. This time it will fail in a different way. <laughs> this time it has been failing, not by producing a Great Depression, but by producing an inflation. Because just as you will hear the story that it was business that was responsible for the Depression, so you will today hear the story that it is labor and management that are responsible for inflation. It is the same kind of a myth. Inflation is made in one place and one place only, Washington, D.C. And in Washington, D.C., the chief source, immediate source of inflation, is a Greek temple on Constitution Avenue, in which, which houses the Federal Reserve Board. An accomplice, and a major accomplice, of course, sits in the halls of Congress in Washington. They are a major accomplice because you tell them to be. The American people have been telling Congress for many years, spend more money on us, please. But they've been telling us, don't raise our taxes. Congress has been listening. It's been spending more money on you. But on the other hand, it's been very unwilling to raise taxes. As a result, it has imposed inflation as a tax. That's one tax that you don't have to vote for, but you have to pay. Let me turn to the third of the myths I want to cover. This is a myth closely related to the Great Depression myth. It is a myth that somehow or other, the private market has failed to provide certain important services and the government has had to step in in response to an overwhelming public demand in order to provide those services. The reality is very different. The reality is that if you look at every program that the government has adopted in the direction of extending its scope, it took an enormous propaganda campaign by 
special propaganda groups to get those measures passed. There was no underlying public demand for those measures. On the contrary, the demand had to be created. It had to be developed. It had to be produced. And it was created, it was developed, it was produced by people who sincerely, I'm not questioning their sincerity, who sincerely wanted to see an expansion in the scope of government. Let me take some of the most prominent examples. Let me take the example which today is the greatest, uh, uh, greatest uh, sacred cow of them all, Social Security. Was there an overwhelming demand for Social Security in the 1930s when the law was adopted? Far from it. There was no public demand for it. It had to be sold. How was it sold? By the slickest devices of Madison Avenue by imaginative packaging and deceptive labeling. Social Security was sold as an insurance scheme. It is not an insurance scheme. There is very little relationship to the amount of money any one individual pays and the amount of money he is entitled to receive. Social Security is a combination of a bad tax system with a bad way of distributing welfare. It's got two components, and I have never known anybody whatever his political or other persuasion, who would defend either component separately. If you look at the tax system, who can defend a, a wage tax? A tax on wages up to a maximum. A tax on work, a tax which discourages employers from hiring people and discourages people from going to work. And a tax which is borne by the lowest wage groups. It's a regressive tax. You could never in a, in, a, in a millions of years, Sundays, you could never have gotten such a tax passed as a tax. Look at the benefit arrangements. Here you have an arrangement under which the amount of money a person receives does not depend on his poverty or his indigence. It depends on the accident of what industry he worked in. If he happened to work in a covered industry, he gets a, a, a benefit. If he happens to work in a non-covered industry, he doesn't. If uh, he has only worked a certain number of quarters and not more, no matter how much, how indigent he is, he doesn't get anything. If he's 65 and he decides to continue to work, earning more than a modest amount per year, not only doesn't he get a benefit, but to add insult to injury, he has to pay taxes on the wages he is receiving in order to finance the benefit he is not receiving. <laughs> if a man who is 65 years old has a million dollars in income from property he is and doesn't work, he gets his full Social Security benefit, tax-free. If the same man goes to work and earns $20,000 a year, he is in the position I just described. He doesn't get any benefit. Is there anybody who would justify that system of distributing benefits? And I could go on to all the uh, difficulties with it. Uh, I've only touched the surface. Note the misleading language. The Social Security system consistently refers to the taxes you pay as a contribution. Now tell me, do you regard taxes as contributions? <laughs> The word contribution denotes voluntary arrangements. If you buy an insurance program, you are contributing freely. If you contribute to the United Way freely, you're contributing freely. But if you pay taxes on your wages as a condition of being employed, that's a tax. It's not a contribution. Again, it always refers to the payments people get as benefits. They are not benefits, they're subsidies. What you have is a system of subsidizing people on the one hand and of taxing it. What about the claim that it's insurance, that there's a relationship between the two? Well, there is a minor relationship. It is true that on the whole, those people who pay more will receive more, other things the same. But every student of the subject has pointed out that the relationship is very small, that most payments are independent of most receipts. Moreover, what you really have is not a system under which people are providing for their own security, as the social security system will say it, as they describe it. 
In their pamphlets, they describe it as a way in which 90% of American workers are providing for their own future. That's nonsense. What people today are doing is paying taxes today to pay the subsidies to the people who are receiving benefits today. What you have is a system of taxing the young at any point in time to subsidize the old. Now, there may be nothing wrong with that. For the moment, I'm not discussing that issue. I'm discussing whether Social Security was a response to a broad-scale public demand or whether it had to be sold to the people by the worst devices of Madison Avenue. And the answer is it clearly was the latter. What you have is a system under which people today are being taxed to pay benefits today to the people who are receiving them. So far, those people who have been receiving payments have received much more than the actuarial value of what they paid. That's because you've had a growing working force, you've had higher wages being paid, wage rates have gone up very, ra I mean the wage tax has gone up very sharply. But the number of recipients is growing relative to the number of people paying. And that's why Social Security is currently in so much financial trouble. That's why the so-called uh, reserve, which is not a reserve at all, the so-called reserve has been getting smaller and smaller. And that's why you have all the agitation for Congress to do something to make Social Security again financially responsible. Again, for the moment, I'm not discussing whether Social Security or the separate parts are good or bad, but only whether it can be regarded as a program adopted in response to a great public demand. Let me take another more recent movement. Consider the imposition on you and me and on our automobiles of all sorts of safety equipment, so-called safety equipment. Nothing to prevent us individually from buying it. But now we are required to buy it by government. Why? Was there a great public demand? Not at all. There was a man named Ralph Nader. Now maybe he arose in response to a public demand, but if so, it was a public demand for entertainment, not for safety. <laughs> but Ralph Nader launched a major propaganda campaign. And as a result of this propaganda campaign, as a result of a great selling effort, also characterized by misrepresentation. Also, uh, as you know, uh, his original weapon was a book, safe at, uh, Unsafe at Any Price, which damned the Corvair as being an unsafe and a knowingly unsafe car. Later studies have demonstrated that his claim was not justified. But that did not prevent it from having its effect. It did not prevent it from adopting it. But the extent to which this did not result from a great public clamor can be shown by what has happened whenever the, uh, uh, the the agency that was established to administer auto safety regulations has overstepped its bounds. You will recall that a few years ago, it tried to impose the requirement of an interlock that no car could be started unless the seat belts were fastened. And that produced such a great public outcry that Congress stepped in and it had to be uh, rescinded. You are now having a similar kind of a controversy about the airbag. Or again, let me take a very different example, one which has not yet emerged, fortunately, the drive for national health insurance. Is there a widespread drive for national health insurance? Not so you can notice it. Indeed, the proponents of it have been trying to get it passed year after year, and so far they haven't gotten it passed. As I say, fortunately, because if so-called national health insurance were passed, it would bear as little relationship to insurance as Social Security does. It's not a program for national health insurance at all. It's a program for socialized medicine. It's a program for making physicians uh, uh, government employees. It's a program for creating long waiting lines and inferior medical service. But that isn't the way it's labeled. But the pressure for it is having to be created and built up by propaganda. Or again, let me take another modern version. Has the FDA's ban on saccharin been in response to a great public outcry for it? Let me turn to the, to the fourth of my myths, the free lunch myth. The belief that somehow or other government can spend money 
at nobody's expense. I don't know how many of you have ever heard of a wonderful description of government that was made by a French economist by the name of Frederick Bastiat about 150 years ago. He said, government is that fiction whereby everybody believes that he can live at the expense of everybody else. And that is the free lunch myth. The myth that somehow or other government can provide goods and services, can spend money at nobody's expense. Now the particular form which that myth takes is very specific. It has two parts. One part is the belief that somehow or other you can tax business without consumers or workers or individuals paying for it. Somehow business is a big source, a big cornucopia out there that can be taxed at no cost. And the other way of form the myth takes is that you can create money at no cost. That if you turn the printing press, if you produce those greenbacks, that will enable people to become richer with nobody becoming poorer. Well, let me look at first problem. Can you tax business? What's business? There's no business to be taxed. There are people. Only people can pay taxes. Can I tax this floor? Can I tax the building? The building can't pay taxes. Only people can pay taxes. So when you talk about a tax on business, it has to be paid by somebody. Either it's paid by the stockholder, or it's paid by the customer, or it's paid by the worker. There's no other way it can come from. There's no, uh, there's no Santa Claus, no tooth fairy, <laughs> that's going to provide a source by which the government can spend money that doesn't come from somebody. Somebody has to pay. And yet, over and over again, you hear the claim, oh, we, cannot inc we must not increase taxes on individuals, we'll increase taxes on business. In connection with the current discussion of Social Security, this fiction arises. There is a fiction that the Social Security tax is half on the individual and half on the employer. Um, it's, uh, that, that the individual only pays 5.75%, the employer plays, pays an equal amount. That's nonsense. That's bookkeeping. That's not economics. That's not reality. The part that the employer pays is part of his wage cost. If an employer considers whether it's worth his while to hire an additional worker, he has to consider as part of his cost not only what he pays to the worker, but also the extra taxes he will have to pay to the government. It makes no difference to the employer at all. If he pays the worker a bigger check and the worker pays a larger part of that directly to the government, or he pays the worker a smaller check, but in addition has to send a check to Washington. What matters to him is the total number of dollars it costs him to hire an additional person. So the fact is, the logic is, the reason is, that the tax on the so-called tax on the employer is paid by the employee. Now, this has always been clear from uh, economic reasoning, general economic reasoning, but it has also been subjected to empirical test. In a book, even from that high, uh, high t uh, from that uh, tempo of belief in greater and bigger government, the Brookings Institution in Washington, published a couple of years ago, demonstrated empirically that the tax on the employer was really paid by the employee, that it was shifted to the employee, and it can't be any other way, as you will see if you think about it. So business doesn't pay that tax. And yet, despite this, you have the great move in Congress right now in remedying the problem of Social Security to impose a larger fraction of the tax on business on the alleged grounds that somehow or other that spares the worker. It doesn't have any such effect. It reduces the incentive to hire people and thus impo is imposed on the worker. But again, if you look at the taxing corporate profits, the distinction you have to draw is between who writes the check and who fundamentally bears the cost. It may well be that an official of a corporation writes the check 
for the tax on profits, so-called profits. He writes the check, but who pays it? He doesn't pay it. Here is a poor fellow who may be earning a, a, a modest competence. He may be writing a check for $10 million. That isn't coming out of his hide. Where's that $10 million coming from? It has to come from the proceeds of the goods and services which the enterprise sells. And that $10 million is $10 million less available either for cutting prices or for paying out dividends or for paying wages and salaries. The tax is borne by people. And for this reason, I must say, I have always myself been strongly in favor of eliminating altogether the tax on corporations. So it's open and above board that you are taxing people and that you do not conceal that fact by appearing to tax corporations. Well, again, with respect to money, can you print money at no cost? It's very cheap to turn out those pieces of paper. But does that get society something for nothing? Not at all. It's simply a different form of taxation. If you print money, people have more money to spend. If they spend, if they spend more money on the same amount of goods, prices go up. And in effect, everybody is paying a tax through inflation. Once again, it's only a form of taxation. Let me turn to my final myth, because it is in some ways the most pervasive, the most dangerous, and the most deep-seated. That is a Robin Hood myth. The myth that government has benefited the poor at the expense of the rich. That's the myth. That's the, those are the terms on which many a governmental program is sold. What is the reality? The reality has been described in an article in the Journal of Law and Economics by my colleague George Stigler under the title of Director's Law. And Director is the name of Aaron Director, who is a professor at the University of Chicago Law School. And I might also say my brother-in-law. <laughs> Director's law is that almost invariably government programs benefit the middle income class at the expense of the very poor and the very rich. Now, that, that may seem to you strange. But let me first explain why it makes logical sense, and second, give you some empirical evidence, starting right here at home with higher education and st the state financing of higher education. On the logical level, you have an economic political system under which laws are passed by 51% of the people voting one way against 49% of the people. Now, the way to get a law passed, therefore, is to form a coalition covering 51% of the people. You might think that you would take the bottom 51% versus the top 49%. But the more you think about it, the more you realize that that's not a very effective way to form a coalition. Why? Because those people who are at the bottom tend to be much less skillful in political activity for the very reasons that leave them at the bottom in the economic scale. They are at the bottom in the economic scale because they have low skills or low abilities or low entrepreneurial capacities or have been unfortunate to have been born handicapped or in groups that are discriminated against. But those same features make them relatively less effective in political activity. Who are the most effective people in political activity? Those of us at the, in the middle, in the middle, of, in the middle classes, where are the people who are literate, where are the people who write for the newspapers, where are the people who mount the hustings, where are the people who, f who provide the candidates? Well, you might say, why doesn't the coalition come from the top all the way down 51%? Well, the answer is that, gee, those people at the top, that's a place we can get a lot of money from. And it's worth sacrificing a few votes to get a large fraction of a tax base. And therefore, the logically most reasonable coalition is sort of 51 percent of the people running from the lower middle class through the upper middle class and leaving out the very rich at the top and the very poor at the bottom. Now, it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes the very rich are able to use their money to get an effective coalition, but most of the time that's the way it works. Now, let me illustrate it in reality, in, in, in the real world. 
One of my favorite examples is state finance of higher education. This is always sold on the ground of providing opportunities to everybody in the society to get an education. But what are the facts? I doubt that there is any program financed by government in the United States which is as regressive in its impact and its financial impact as the financing of higher schooling. Who are the people who go to school? Who are the people who are attending this university? Mostly people who come from middle, upper middle or lower middle income class families. If there are a few among you who come from lower income families, you are going to be among the middle and upper income classes. You are the richer among the poor. They are the people who go to school. They are the people who get the benefit from it. Your training here will enable you to get higher incomes than you otherwise could. Who pays for it? Well, you pay for it and your family and friends pay for it, not through tuition. I am told your tuition covers about 15% of the cost of your schooling. The taxpayers pay for it, including the people who don't go to school. Some years ago, there was a study made for the state of California which showed that 50% of the students at state-supported institutions of higher education came from the top 25% of the income class, and 5% came from the bottom 25% of the income class. This is a program. When I talk in California and want to be demagogic, I say it's a program to impose taxes on the people in Watts to send the children from Beverly Hills to college. <laughs> now you here in Utah know better what the local equivalents of that are. Now I'm not blaming you as individuals again. I couldn't do that because I myself am a beneficiary of state support of higher education. I went through a school that has since become a state university, Rutgers University in the state of New Jersey, on a state scholarship. Now, I think I benefited from going to the university, although I know, and I think even maybe the, the country at large did, although I know there are many people who disagree with that. <laughs> but there's no reason why I shouldn't have paid for it. What did the poor citizens in New Jersey get? The day I graduated from college, I left New Jersey, and I've hardly ever been back since. There's a strong case to be made that everybody who wants to go to university should have an opportunity to do so, provided he's willing to pay for it. Not necessarily right now. It's highly desirable to have arrangements under which he can borrow now to pay it back later out of a higher income that his education will make possible. But there is no justification for imposing taxes on lower income people to finance the schooling of people who are or will be in the higher income groups. And yet, how much political movement is there to impose full cost tuition on colleges? There is nobody who would have a ghost of a chance of being elected to a legislature or to the state house on that program. It's the hardest thing in the world, legislatively, to get higher tuitions imposed. Why? because the middle class looks after itself, because of director's law. Now, what's true for higher education is true in every other area. Consider Social Security. Now, Social Security is also sold as a program to benefit the poor. What are the facts? Social Security is a program which imposes unduly heavy taxes on the lower income groups in the society to provide higher benefits to upper income groups in the society. How does it work? It's not because of the regressive nature of the wage tax. It's not because of the structure of benefits. It's because of a very simple phenomenon. At what age do younger men from the lower classes go to work? 16, 17, 18, 19. That's when they start to pay Social Security taxes. At what age are you people going to go to work and start paying Social Security taxes? Some of you may, in part-time jobs, have been doing so. But you will be a full-time Social Security pay, uh, payers only when you reach your middle 20s. So they will pay taxes for more years than you will pay taxes. Next, 
Which one is going to receive benefits for longer? Every demographic study has shown that the average expected length of life of middle and upper income classes is longer than the average length of life of people from the lower income classes. So those poor suckers are going to pay taxes for more years <laughs> and receive payments for fewer years than you, than you and I will. Now some of us, by virtue of continuing to work between 65 and 72, will not be in that favored class. But already, the fraction of people who work between 65 and 72 has been cut to a small part of what it used to be because of the incentive offered by Social Security. And overall, there is little doubt, therefore, that Social Security is a program which transfers income from low-income classes to high-income classes. Same thing is true of almost every other social program you can mention. I have often challenged people to find a single governmental program in which the people who pay taxes have higher incomes than those who get the benefits. I know only one, and that's direct relief, public assistance, the aid to families of dependent children. It's not a good program, it's a terrible program, it's a welfare mess. But so far as I can find out, it's the only program that demonstrably transfers income from higher income classes to lower income classes. And that's why it's such an unpopular program. <laughs> Director's Law shows up in the unpopularity of the welfare mess as well as in the popularity of Social Security, housing programs, and the like. I could go down a great many others, but time will not permit. I come to my conclusion that if we are going to look forward to the future, to an end of this reduction in our freedom and the growth in centralized government, I think we must begin to dismantle these myths which are so widely accepted by people, which have become an unthinking part of their philosophy and of their beliefs. And I hope that in the course of this hour, I have deflated your air mattress and given you an uncomfortable jolt. Thank you.